fine. Okay. So the topic we're going to go over tonight is um, is a commonly asked question, and uh, that is the C-frame versus the DRDT and how to use both of them. The uh, C-frame, I, I like to classify them as two different categories. The C-frame is an impact tool where uh, the, the DRDT and other tools like it are compression tools. And that's why when you look at the two, uh, the C-frame is a fairly light duty unit. Um, all it's doing is maintaining alignment of the RAM and you, you hit it with a hammer to give that percussion force that makes the dimple. Versus the compression unit that when you squeeze it, or it works just like a squeezer, when you put the force on it, it wants to spread the frame, it wants to bend the frame all the time. So those are the, the two different types of frames that you can use for dimpling. Um, so I'm going to switch over to my other camera here, which is set up on the C-frame, and we're going to start with um, start with talking about the C-frame. Hopefully, it just switched. It looks like um, Gary. I can see your picture. I saw your thumbs up. Can you still hear me when I switch cameras? Mike, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So, so this is a close-up of the C-frame tool with the dies set up in it. So we always put the dimple die in the bottom, and uh, sorry, the male dimple die in the bottom, and the female in the top. And what that does is you saw my uh, table earlier, uh, the photo of that, it allows you to uh, l build up a flat table around the C-frame that supports the whole skin so you don't have a, the skin trying to bow and you're, you're pressing down and, and trying to make a mess. With the, the uh, small pieces that I have, it's fairly easy for me to just put pressure on the RAM and the piece stays there. But as the piece gets larger, it's going to want to sag and obviously that affects your alignment. So the beauty of the C-frame tool is that it keeps the dimple dies exactly perpendicular to your material. So what people don't seem to understand about the C-frame is that it's a, it's a percussion force and you can really qu quite easily hear when the dimple is complete um, rather than having to see it and evaluate it, you can hear it pretty well. Now what I'm going to do for this demonstration is I am going to scuff up this piece of material. Sorry for the reflections here. Let's see if I can get it so you can see it. Um, so I'm just going to scuff it up with a piece of scotch bright. So I'm going, I'm, I'm um, taking the shine off of the Alclad over the top of all of these dimples. And when I do that, it allows me to show you what I'm looking for a little bit easier. So, so now you can see that most of the reflection is gone there. It's more of a dull matte finish. The Alclad is still here, but it's it just the shine is off. So what I'm going to do, first of all, when you dimple, you're bending a piece of metal. And just like when you bend a piece of metal in the break, um, you, it pops back to some extent. So you have to overbend it. And that's what our springback dimple dies do, is they allow you to, or they overbend the metal so that when it pops back, it pops back flat again. And just like uh, when you bend any other piece of metal, when you do it and it pops back, um, you kind of bend it again until it stays, right? Mm -hmm. So the first, the first um, hit is going to do most of the work here, and then there's going to be a second and sometimes even a third hit uh, to complete the dimple. And I guess I should show you, I, this is the wrong camera to do it in, but you can, you can see the hammer that I'm using. This is an 8 ounce dead blow ball peen hammer. And I really like to use, in fact I almost insist that you use, a hammer with a hard steel face on it. Now the reason for that is if you use a hammer like this, which is also a dead blow, but it's a plastic mallet, um, and some of that force is absorbed in the hammerhead itself. And so you don't get that crisp, sharp force on the end of the uh, ram that transfers into the aluminum as you do with uh, a hammer that's hard faced. Some people like to use a heavier hammer and just, you know, barely move it like an inch or so, which is fine. It's just personal preference. We built most of our RV4 with a claw hammer. Um, nothing wrong with that. Just whatever weight you're comfortable with. Um, here's another example of a soft-faced mallet. Um, and I'd, 
another reason I don't like these, not only because you don't get that sharp force and your dimple is not quite as crisp, um, but you can't hear quite as well what you're what you're looking for. And, and I'll do a couple here and you'll see what I'm talking about. So the first one's going to do most of the force. The second one's is just going to crisp it up a little bit. And when I do this, um, you'll hear the tone change from kind of a thud into uh, more of a ping. And you want to listen for that tone change because then you know that it's done. So here goes. So that, that one was probably too hard. I'm going to do one more. It went more to like a clang than a ping, so I'll do it again. There. That's, that's I think, what I was looking for. Let me do another one. And so you get that rhythm down, and it's really very easy to duplicate. So, like I said, I scuffed up this material to start with. Let's see if I can get the right focus here. Okay, there's a great one to focus on. Now you see there's always going to be this ring on the outside of the dimple die. That, that's normal, it's just the way that dies work. You see this ring on the inside that is right next to the dimple itself? You want that to be there, but you want it to be as small as possible. I'll, I'll overdo one and I'll show you why it makes a difference. Now, first of all, I, I always want to tell people that as far as airworthiness goes, none of this matters. If you're just slapping a plane together to go fly it, um, this doesn't matter. I'm, I'm teaching you how to be nitpicky to get the best results you can. And so with the, with the C-frame and the sudden impact, um, you get nice crisp dimples and it's not very much effort. One thing I didn't mention, and I don't know if you can see it in the video, but when I go to hit it, I hold down on the ram. So I'm taking all the slop out of anywhere that I can. So all the force is going directly into the material. So the way we test dimples is we lay a flat razor blade and works really well, um, but a flat uh, straight edge over the top of it. And you notice that it is straight all the way along the skin. And then if you drop a rivet in here, it should be flat across the top of the rivet when the rivet's set as well. So that's one way you can really quickly and easily see if you're doing it right. I'm going to try and do another one here, underdone, where I'm just not putting enough pressure on it. And usually people don't have this trouble, but once in a while in classes we found that we would find somebody that did. So let me underdo one. Okay, so now when I put a straight edge across that one, you see that it definitely leaves. And give me some feedback, Bill, if you're not able to see what I'm talking about. But here you can definitely see that it's leaving the straight edge of the razor blade. Um, and obviously that's not what you want because you're, you're putting a dent in each, in each place that should have a dimple. Now I'm going to overdo one. And you hear that it kind of turns into a clang there. Now when you do that, again, let me see if I can get my camera to work right. Um, focus. Other way. <laughs> or there you go. Yeah, I was, I was focusing it in more of a macro view. See how that, that um, boy, it's just so hard to show. Silver on, on light. Um, this, this ring around the outside of the dimple grows as you hit it too hard. And then, again, I'll start try and get her focused right here. You can now it's it's not showing on this one, but but you can actually see it lift from this point here to this point here will be lifted up a little bit in the air, and so it'll be straight along, but just lifted at the rivet, and that's what happens if you hit too hard. So but basically, again, this, basically the razor blade will rock on top of the uh, the dimple. Yeah, that's a good explanation, yep. Um, so let me put this back in autofocus and see if it likes it even better. 
No. Okay. Um, so that's the impact tool, anyway. Um, trying to think if there's anything I forgot about that. So basically, we're listening to for that uh, ping. We're listening for that tone change to know if the dimple is complete or not. And like I said, once you get going on a, a wing skin, for instance, it doesn't take more than a couple dimples to get that figured out. And pardon the motion sickness while I switch my camera here over to the DRDT tool. Now, the DRDT tool works just like a pneumatic squeezer would work, where um, it's putting that compression force. For those of you who don't know what the DRDT tool and the C-frame tool is, there's a good opportunity to back up a little bit. So the C-frame tool, this, is a, this, is, this one's a little shorter. It's an older model, but it's a 22-inch deep throat um, that allows you to get to the center of any wing or fuselage skin. The DRDT tool, which was designed by Paul Mrems out in uh, Tucson, can't get this out of the way, um, is this tool here where it's a giant frame. And the advantage of this tool over this tool is it's quiet. Um, Paul was working in his garage, I believe it was, in a condo. And his neighbors complained about the C-frame being too loud. So he, that's why he designed the DRDT. And it uses a toggle link lever up here to apply the force. And then we also now have a hydraulic unit that goes on the end here. But both ways, it's applying 3,000 pounds of force here. And that's why this has to be so beefy to take all the, all the force that that's putting out. Let me get adjusted here. Okay, so I'm going to, behind the scenes here, I'm scuffing up another piece of uh, sample material. And while Mike's doing that, I just want to reiterate to everyone who's live in the Hangout, um, there is a chat window. If you want to go ahead and click on the chat icon in the upper left-hand side of the uh, browser window, it says chat. There's Cody. Yes. <laughs> Funny, thanks. Um, and anybody who's watching live, uh, this is the first uh, Hangout where we've had more than 10 participants. So we appreciate uh, everybody watching live. And I know, um, oh, 14. That's great. Thanks, Gary. Um, so it is broadcasting live on YouTube, so we appreciate everybody there. If you have questions, definitely post them on our uh, Google Plus page, and we'll be sure to get them answered. Thanks. I'm fighting my camera here. I've, am, I've gone back to manual focus, so if I do something wrong, just yell at me. But again, I have the bottom, um, the male die in the bottom and the female die in the top. And again, you would want to build some kind of support structure around, uh, around this to support the material. The way this works is you put the dimple in there, and then you just push down on, on this handle. And, I guess that's not in the frame, but you, you just go until you can't go anymore. And that's one thing that people talk about consistency of the DRDT is that you, could, you just go until it stops once you have it set right. Now, to get it set right, I guess let me just kind of hand hold this thing and hopefully the bandwidth will deal with that. Um, when you, to get it set right, there's a toggle link mechanism just like in our hand squeezer. And you want to get this joint here past center. So once you get it there, you're getting all the pressure that you can get on it. And so that's how you want to set it up so that when you do that, you feel the frame spring. And with the comp any compression type tool, you really want to put as much pressure on it as you can because you, you just won't get as much pressure as you can with the hammer. So it, looking at the back of this, what I'm what I can do here is I'm I'm trying to hold it still so that you can look at the top of my display cabinets, which has a straight black line on it, and you can see that that piece is just as flat when I'm done dimpling it as when I started. So let's flip it over and look at the front side again. And come on. There we go. You can see that that, that ring appears which is what we're looking for, but we want that to be just as minimum as we can. So we probably could back off the pressure on, on this thin skin 
just a little bit so that so that, that we could minimize that ring. Um, but that's the advantage of the DRDT and any of the, the squeezing type um, units is that they put they put a force on the end of it. Um, it's repeatable every time, and uh, you have one hand on the handle of this and the other hand on the material. Where with the uh, C-frame, you really have to have one hand on the ram and the other uh, has the hammer in it. So you put the hammer down, move the skin, and pick the hammer up again. The other advantage of the C-frame, I guess I didn't talk about, other than the uh, having the um, having ability to put more force on it, which is important when you get into like screw dimple dies and things that, that have a, a bigger uh, dimple that you're bending further, is that um, you can take this out and you can put in a, a back riveting tool. I believe I showed that in another video that uh, you can put in a back riveting tool and you can use this for riveting where the DRDT is only for, squeeze, uh, only for squeezing dimples. Um, I wanted to go on and show, I had put in the agenda a little teaser about um, Lee's um, laser pointer and that was in Kit Planes magazine last, last month or two months ago, I can't remember but um, they had a little article about that and one of our customers built up a little kit that's a little $20 kit and it allows you to put this laser crosshair on the on C-frame or a DRDT and so you can quickly find where the male die is underneath this big sheet that you're working on. I never really found that to be a problem but when I when I pulled this out of the box and, and started messing with it it was amazing how much time it saved just finding that hole. Um, I thought that was really cool. And he's going to sell this kit uh, for about twenty dollars. So we're we're getting feedback on on if people are interested and and um, you know what the interest level is. I guess I should say one thing I was worried about. I'm trying to flash the laser light in the camera here. But one thing I was worried about, and I had thought about this years ago when somebody suggested using a dot laser is it bouncing off the shiny aluminum and hitting you in the eye, but it really doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, one of the neatest things that uh, <laughs> we, we had happen is as I was hooking this up, Annette came in and goes, oh, what's that? And, and I said, here, look, and she, she shines the, the laser on here and she starts moving around. She goes, what's that for? And just as she found the tie and she's like, oh, wow, that's cool. So, so uh, there, it has been a neat thing. It's uh, it, it surprised me that there's you know that it was um, handy and, and something that that would be well used. So I'm going to switch cameras again. Bear with me just a minute. And I haven't been watching the chat window, but let let me know if you have any questions as we go. And I'm, I'm sure Bill. Yep, I'm keeping an eye. On. Okay. Let me switch that off, and um, dimple die quality. Um, one of the things I wanted to show, and I'm just going to do a piece of shiny stuff again here with the C-Prime real quick. Switched cameras too soon, didn't I? Okay, so one of the things I wanted to show is how to use the the available light. I guess I'm going to go back to the other camera, sorry. Okay. I'll try and just make it focus in here. Okay, a lot of times I'll use a, a fluorescent light out in the shop or the edge of a hangar door. There's kind of a straight edge. And I was I was kind of showing this before. It's just really difficult to do um, on a camera. And see, I can kind of make make the that straight edge of whatever that is over there um, kind of go across the dimple. And that way I know that the, the aluminum is still flat. And if you if you use dies that don't perform very well, the spring back isn't accurately controlled and, and uh, 
they're, you know, are just not good dyes. Oh, there's a nice line to work with. Um, you can really see by using this mirror technique the distortion. See how right there at the edge of the dimple I can kind of suck that, that line in just a little bit by using the distortion. So, so this is a really flat dimple, and that's how you want to evaluate whether or not you're using good dimple dyes. Because, like I said in my agenda, you can make 14,000 mistakes on your airplane just by using the wrong dimple dye. And so, you got to remember that when you get done, um, when you get done with the airplane, this is all going to be painted up, and it's going to essentially look like a mirror sitting out in the sun. So, each of these distortions you will see. And so, for just a little bit more effort by you know, setting things up and making sure that um, you're able to, uh, making sure you're able to uh, do the best job possible, then then you just get that perfect outcome on every single dimple, and that's that's really what we're we're after is is teaching people how to do quality work that they can that they have available. So. Um, let me just read some of the. Are, are there questions in here that I need to reply to? No, we're just uh, we're just having some conversation. <laughs> I see. Okay, so good deal. I think uh, if anybody does have any questions, uh, definitely either utilize the chat window or you can go ahead and post them on the uh, the Google Plus page. Um, Mike, it looks like there's one photo that was posted. Um, let me see if I can get to that information. Basically, it's it looks like a photo of um, some sample rivets or sample dimples that have been done on a piece of aluminum, and okay. there was varying degrees of um, it looks like varying degrees of pressure, and it looks like the the far outer ring is very very significantly um, present on it. So I'm I'm not sure if um, I think maybe it was is that's on, that's on the Google Plus page. It is. <laughs> How do I find that? Okay. <laughs> I'm trying, just a second. And for some reason, if you click on it, it doesn't actually show that photo, so you just have to look at it in the preview. Oh, okay. We're loving Google tonight. Yeah. Well, that's all scuffed up, just like I said, so that you can see what you're doing. I don't understand what this uh, this ring... Can you see my mouth or not? Uh, I can see your mouth. Okay. I don't understand what this ring around the outside edge is. That looks... That's very confusing to me. Um, who's... Uh, I think he actually dropped off. I'm not... Uh, I'm not quite sure who it was, but... Oh, okay. Um, the, well, first of all, it looks like there's too much pressure there because it's doing that in general. But um, it almost looks like the dyes are contacting on the outside surfaces first instead of the inside, um, which they shouldn't do that. Um, let me try something. Can you see my whole screen? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. You see SolidWorks opening. Yep. This is this is a example that I I debated showing, but we'll we'll go ahead and open it up quick here. Maybe. What I'm going to show here is a cross section of the dies in a piece of aluminum. And it'll just kind of show how the dyes work, and and hopefully a little bit more be a, a little bit more of a visual of what I'm talking about here. Okay. Hope I don't give away any of the skunk work secrets here. Okay, so this is this is a dimple dye, believe it or not. There we go. This is a dimple dye with a, just a little sample. Now, all of this is drawn based on actual dimensions. Hey, Mike, I can't actually see uh, that application running. Really? I just see the browser window. 
Well, why don't we uh, why don't we move on to the next agenda item, and we'll actually post um, post the drawing on the Google Plus page after the Hangout. Okay, that's a good idea. What I what I wanted to show is how the the dimple dies actually come in contact with each other right at the outside of the dimple first, and then the the spring back angle works its way out to the outside. So, but yeah, I'll I'll grab some screenshots and post them onto that page as soon as we're done here. I'm lost. How do I get back? Just a minute. Is this me? There we go. Okay. So what's on the agenda item? <laughs> uh, I think you've covered most of, you just talked about the laser kit, how to tell a perf perfect dimple from not quite perfect, mm -hmm. and then we were going to talk about uh, inferior dyes. Okay, and, and that's kind of what I was talking about. Well, that the other picture is a good example. I, I, I can't imagine that was done with our dyes, but I guess anything's possible. Um, you really have, what's different about our dimple dyes is we, we machine them on a machine that holds uh, tolerances down into well, the fifth decimal place, really. We're only able to measure down at the fourth decimal place, down to one ten thousandth of an inch. And we hold them there within one ten thousandth of an inch. And we found that within three ten thousandths of an inch, um, the, d the dyes don't work the same anymore. Um, with the angles, the angles we're talking about are, are tenths of a degree, or a hundredth of a degree of angle will change the way the dimple dyes work in both the uh, dimple portion and the springback portion. And so that's, that's why we invested in a machine that was capable of doing the super high precision stuff. Um, we tried to have job shops do our dimple dies for us before we before we bought the machine and, and no one could hold a tolerance as within more than a half thousandth or so. And you know that's what our competitors are are making dimple dies on. And and you can take two of their dies and measure them and they're not the same. And without that consistency, without each one being exact, then each dimple on your airplane is not going to be exact. Um, that's why we we talk about being able to make 14,000 mistakes on your airplane and, and, and really the attention to detail and making them just perfect is, is what sets our dyes apart. And so by using the techniques that I just showed you, you can go back and you can evaluate your dyes and go, you know, I can't get it to look that way. Um, and if you, if you can or if you can't see the difference, um, you know, that's, that's great. So. Uh, we tried probably two dozen different size, different sets of dyes before we found one that worked kind of acceptable uh, when we built our RB4, and that's how we got into this business is making dimple dyes. Uh, so that's what to look for, and uh, if I can tell anybody, you know, try our dyes, and and if you don't see the difference, uh, send them back, and we'll give your money back. I don't, I'm not sure that we ever had anybody take us up on that. So uh, they do, they do make a tremendous difference. Okay, so uh, the next uh, next item up, there were a couple of questions that came through before the uh, before the hangout. We've got about uh, 15 minutes, and I think if we go a few minutes longer, nobody will complain because I was the one who was late. Well, they, they were complaining on the front end. Okay. Um, so the first uh, couple of questions come from Mark Kidman. Um, he was looking to see the difference in the keyless cups. Right. Keep, keep talking. Keep reading the question. I'll be right back. So there wasn't much of a question. It was uh, just to show the, the difference in the keyless chucks. Uh, the next question that Mark had asked was demonstrating uh, or, or requesting to demonstrate the Boeing QC system. So uh, I believe Mike is going to go run and grab a couple of chuck examples, and um, I'll be back to, to get us set up. So one of the conversations going on in the sidebar here, we were just um, chatting. Cody and I were just chatting about getting signed up for the email newsletter. 
I know probably several of you came in from uh, Vans Air Force today. Uh, Doug did us a great favor and, and put us up at the top for the Hangout. Um, I did post a link to our sign-up form for our builder newsletter. goes out monthly. Um, I was telling Cody we do just a couple of, uh, of specials every year, but mostly it is product spotlight and other helpful information for builders. So. Um, if any of you came and saw us at, uh, at Oshkosh, you probably heard a consistent story from every one of us, which was, you know, we're really here to help builders. Uh, we're not, selling tools is, you know, how we pay our bills, but um, what we really enjoy doing is, is helping builders get the most out of their, out of their tools and uh, have, uh, have a great finished product when they're done. Sorry, Bill, for running away there. I forgot to bring the keyless chucks, and everything in our packing room has changed since Oshkosh, and I just plain can't find them in a few minutes. So I have here the Boeing Quick Change Chuck, which is one of the things that Mark asked about. Uh, the Quick Change Chuck works just like the air chuck on the bottom here, where you pull back the ring and it disconnects, and you push it on and it reconnects. So same deal here. You have a knurled ring, and you pull it out, and then you can take any tool, put it in there, and it locks. Has, they have these little balls in the shaft, and it locks in there. So it makes changing your tools really quick. And I like these little adapters that hold the threaded bits, so it keeps everything real short and compact. Um, you can take that out, put a reamer in. Uh, you don't have to hunt for the chuck key. So they, they work really well. What I wanted to show is the difference between the, the Rome chuck the imported all metal chuck. Do I have some behind my head? Hey, okay, how about this? How about this? Okay. So it won't quite reach. Um, the the Rome chuck is slightly shorter than the all metal red chuck. Let me see if I can get the autofocus turned back on. There we go. So the the one on the top is the made in Germany Rome chuck, and it has really nice um, nicely ground jaws that come out there. The imported one is also quite nice for an imported tool, but it's a little bit longer, imported from the east, that is. It's a little bit longer with this uh, thing that sticks out the back here. And any length at all makes these metal chucks feel real heavy, makes the, the drill feel really front heavy. And then we have this plastic chuck here that um, is just a, the quality you would see like on a, on a cheap um, cordless electric drill. But um, the advantages of the keyless chucks, obviously, are that they can use any um, any different size drill bits where the Boeing Quick Change system has um, adapters for every single drill bit. So to get set up with the chuck and with the different adapters, um, I can't remember how many. There's probably 10 or 12 different adapters that we recommend, and it's about it's in the range of 130 to 150 dollars to get set up with the Boeing Quick Chain system. But you, then you never have to look for the chuck key, and it's really slick. And then if you have an odd size one, you can just um, switch to an electric or cordless drill or whatever to do an odd size bit. But um, our our kit for this comes with. Uh, adapter, three adapters for the number 30s and three for the number 40s. Um, what those are for is a long extension bit, a regular bit, and then a reamer so that you can get um, all your common tools to just chuck back and forth. Then we also recommend you use two micro stops at that point because if you're spending the money to upgrade to the quick change system, you don't want to be taking out a number 40 countersink cutter that and then switching it to something else where once you have it set up for the right depth with the 40, it's going to be that way for um, till the cutter is dull and so you can just leave it set up and then you can use the other one to do the odd sizes but obviously the number 40 is, is what you do most of the uh, countersinking on. So 
Hey, uh, uh, Mike, we had one, one other question come in. Uh, Mark, who posed the question oh, originally, yeah. um, he's asking about the loss of concentricity with the QC chuck. Yep, yeah. there, is, there is a little bit of that because you have a straight shaft in here going into a straight hole, so you obviously have the tolerance um, in there. The tolerance, I just looked this up the other day, I should know. I believe it's plus a half thousandths minus one and a half. So there's there's up to two thousandths different between the chuck and the the shaft, but and you can you can feel it. You do you do notice that loss of concentricity. But first of all, for doing the the um, quick build RV kit or not quick build but pre punched RV kits, uh, we normally use a reamer, and they have, it have we're going to talk about that in a minute, but has like a 45 degree point all the way around so they they do a nice job of centering themselves already um, and I, I just I use this and I don't notice the loss of concentricity if if you're really finicky about that thing then this probably isn't the system that you want I'm, let me see if I can yeah, I just can't effectively show this this is the end of this drill bit is probably moving 15 to 20 thousandths up and down because of that. Does that answer your questions, Mark? One thing I could do is when you put the drill bit in there and you turn it, <laughs> You really don't see the the wobble. You're, you're seeing mostly the flutes on the drill bit. Uh, yeah, in my opinion, it it doesn't matter. Uh, I have never seen you know holes get more elongated or anything like that because of the use of this chuck. And I use this exclusively, mostly because I can never find the chuck key. So doesn't take long before when you have this stuff laying around in at work it doesn't take long before you quit looking for your chuck key okay um, we have three questions that came in from Jeff uh, I know I feel bad Jeff um, wasn't able to get into the the live hangout so he is watching um, watching on the YouTube version on the broadcast, so okay. I want to make sure that we get to his uh, his questions here. So he's building an RV-14, yep. and he was asking about um, tricks for nut plates. Okay, I'm going to start with his question about the wheel, because okay. I have it in front of me. Um, okay. One, I, I didn't have a, a good way to bring a grinder in here, um, so I have a static display. Um, one of the, the way I usually work with the wheel is I put the the piece at an angle like this, I definitely don't want it to do this. I don't want it to be grabbing or catching on the wheel. I don't, and this seems to eat the wheel away a lot more if you keep it flat against here. If you keep it straight up and down, then it cuts grooves into the wheel, which is also undesirable because it uses the wheel up faster. So I, I try and keep it at an angle about like this, and I um, I will start uh, usually at the bottom and kind of work work my way down an edge until I get you know past halfway and then I'll flip it over and do the same thing the other direction. If I the more straight up and down you keep it, the less of a burr the wheel makes on the edge. Um, if you keep it more sideways, you'll you'll find a, a little bit of a hairy feel on the bottom of the edge where then you have to come back with scotch bright and take that off of the edge. So I try and keep it fairly vertical, but not vertical enough that it cuts into the wheel. So that's how I use that. And yeah, feel free to an, uh, ask any more follow-up questions when you when you hear this, or if you want to send me emails, that's fine. We can do it that way. Um, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Uh, nut plate tricks. I believe he was asking specifically about dimpling. Dimpling nut plates. Yeah. Well, the only way to dimple a nut plate is to use a small diameter die, which is like this, where the female die is, um, is 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. That way it fits inside of 
like that, inside of the nut plate, like so. And then you use your male die, and this is obviously done in the squeezer or in the C-frame. Um, probably the easiest way to do it would be in the C-frame if you have a bunch of them to do. Um, and then use your standard male die on the outside, and that will make the dimpled impression in the nut plate. Is there any difference in tonality that we should be uh, looking out for since that's a clear... <laughs> No, you want to use the largest hammer that you can possibly find to do that. It's, uh... Oh, I sent all my Clecos home with you, Bill. I don't have any in my toolbox. Um, no, you, it takes a lot of pressure to dimple nut plates, and that's why it's easier to do them in the, in the C-frame than it is to do it with a squeezer, because you really have to hit them quite hard, being steel and being... Uh, a, a bit thicker as well as than the aluminum. Uh, what I was going to do with the Clecos is generally, um, if you haven't done this at all yet, generally you, you take the 332nd Cleco, you run it through your hole, and then into the screw portion of the nut plate, and that will, the Cleco will go through there and it'll hold the nut plate to the material. And then you can turn it. Uh, most of the holes now are pre punched, all three of them. So you can turn it to key it in with the uh, the rivet hole, put another Clico through there. Sometimes you have to do that from the other side. And then um, then you can set your rivet in the, the last remaining hole that's open. Any other questions about that? Um, the, the full question was asking about installing the nut plate. So if there's any tips that you've got on that. that that's... The only thing would be to to that is that you can actually click go through the screw hole in, in most cases, um, but no, no other tips other than that. Okay. If you're do, if you're doing uh, nut plates on like inspection panels and lightning holes and things, we do have a, a small one inch yoke for the squeezer that's kind of handy to get in there and just be able to go around without having anything get in the way. Uh, Jeff's last question was about a uh, drill bit versus a reamer, and I know right. you talked a little bit about that earlier. Yeah, so we really need to find a better camera for detailed shots than we have. Um, I'm going to push it all the way to macro view and see if I can hold it close enough to make it work here. Okay. So when you have a drill bit in a hole, this is this is an eighth inch in a in a number forty hole, but hopefully it will allow my example to be better. Okay, so you're you're skating. Come on, there we go. You're skating those two flutes around on the soft material. Um, there, a r drill bit really wants to follow its own pilot hole, and there's no pilot hole here. So what happens, especially when you start to break through to the other side, is it, it's, it's chattering, it's wobbling, and you, you start to get, especially as the drill bit gets dull and you're pushing too hard, you start to get a triangular-shaped hole, or what's called tear-out, um, around here. What, the, what differs with the reamer, instead of the drill bit... Um, is the reamer, first of all, is made to enlarge a hole. And I hope you can see it has, it has uh, tips on it that are about 45 degrees. It makes about 45 degrees. And so it centers itself really nicely in the hole. Again, if I had the right size reamer. I do actually have it. I just didn't think that it would show as well with the smaller reamer. Uh, so, so that centers itself really nicely in the hole with four flutes, and then as you turn it, it just takes the material out um, around the outsides, and it's, it leaves a perfect hole when you're done. And also, the important part to me is that the backside doesn't have a burr on it. So the way I have done any kits recently is I've actually just taken them out of the, out of the box. I've peeled the blue skin off. Um, I've reamed every hole and then just just hit it with scotch Brite like that on both sides and then um, dimple it and then put it together for the first time um, when it 
with all the holes reamed because they make just perfect holes and and the kits are so pre-punched that they they just they just line up so I haven't had any trouble with that but that's my my own personal way of doing it and it saves a ton of time any other questions I think we got through quite a bit okay well, I don't see any more that have come up in the sidebar. I know that uh, Jeff had just posted a question here on the Google Plus page about dimpling using a squeezer versus using a C-frame. Okay. Um, the squeezers are used for the entire substructure of the airplane for dimpling. Um, every, every stiffener, every rib, every bulkhead gets done with the squeezer. The the uh, the skins all get done with the C-frame. Now there's probably some exceptions to that where one would be handier than the other, um, but even like on a large wing skin or something, I I think it's easier just to do the whole thing while it's laying on the table with the C-frame than than messing around doing the edges with the squeezer. And the dimples, like I said at the very beginning, the dimples are better with the with the C-frame than they are with the squeezer. You can just the the sudden impact just makes a more crisp dimple. So that's that's where you use the two differently. Okay, and there's uh, nothing else coming in through the chat window here. So I think if, there, if there's any other questions, people can unmute their microphone, I guess, at this time, and we can start taking them that way if if there's a want or need for that. So just to remind everybody, there's. Uh, a red microphone icon in the upper right hand corner of your chat window or the, I'm sorry, the Google Hangout window. If you'd like to unmute, you can just click on that and ask Mike your questions. Also, if anybody has any um, topics that they'd like us to cover, we'd certainly be encouraged sharing those too. So one, uh, one other question that came in on the Google Plus page from Mark was, do we need to use different a different dimple die set for different material thicknesses? Good question. Um, interesting question. We had a, When we started making dies, we originally thought that. We thought that probably it would take a different set of dies for the squeezer as for the seat frame. And probably it would take a different set of dies for um, each different skin thickness. Um, I mean, just mathematically, it works out that way, right? So... Um, we we really were surprised when I mean we had this we had a 40 foot long shop and probably 35 foot feet of it was counter and we had different combinations of male and female dimple dies in you know different ten thousandths of an inch you know that we would try um, to to see what gave us the best and you know we would each try different things and each each decide which is the best independently and then and then come together and see if there was a consensus and the ones that we finally arrived at after about a year and a half worth of doing this kind of thing is um, is the set that you know this the sizes that we sell um, once we figured out one size it was pretty easy to apply that to different sizes of rivets but um, but we found out that you know a ten thousandth different between between one and the other um, was was probably within the margin of error. So, um, yeah, we just have the one size, and it works equally as well in the C-frame, the squeezer, the different sizes of material, you know, up to up to what you would normally countersink, of course. So, uh, but from O to O up to O thirty two in the in the three thirty second size, um, I'll take the same. Yeah. And we do have different different dies for substructure because of the way that the two pieces nest together. Um, and that's that's a whole other conversation. We did cover that a little bit um, in the July hangout, if you wanted to go back on YouTube and watch that. That would be toward, I believe it was toward the end of that hangout. Great. So I think that covers um, all the questions. I know, so Wesley was the gentleman who posted the photo of um, the aluminum, the, the dies that he used, and he said, I posted the pick of the bad die throwaway. Uh, those are not from Cleveland, but they are U.S. 
USATCO? How do you say that? USATCO? Oh. Yeah. Well, we, we don't need to publicize the brand name. Okay. I just... <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just quoting uh, okay. qu quoting Wesley here. Okay. Uh, so he just he wanted to to show the um, what happens if you use bad dyes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So thanks, Wesley. Yeah. Uh, what size were those? Does he does it I couldn't quite tell. It doesn't say what size. So Wesley, if you're still listening, um, and you would like to go ahead and post uh, a little bit more information about uh, about the bad dyes that you used on. On that example, there. Let's, let's see. I don't know if you can hear me. This is Gary. I my RB6 has been fine only 16 years. I didn't have to do it. I got two dots. After 20 or 30 holes, if you dive, you need to go see how they were wearing. Spend the money on a good dive. You don't have to put it. Mike, if you can repeat the question, I had a really hard time hearing that. Um, um, who was that? Was that Wesley there? No, that was Gary. Gary, okay. I, I had a hard time hearing it as well, um, but I did, I, obviously because I didn't recognize Gary's voice. That's, that's one I should have picked out, but yeah, there was a bandwidth issue there. Um, all, all I got out of it was um, that he bought cheap dyes and that, that to, to make sure you spend money on good dyes. Good, good tools make the difference. So. Thanks, Gary. All right. And I, I would really like this to be more more of a hangout where we're all hanging out here talking to each other rather than Bill and I talking back and forth. So yeah, don't don't hesitate to chime in. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'll close with my usual um, my usual promotion of all of our social channels and. Um, Encourage everybody to sign up for the email newsletter, the builder newsletter that uh, goes out monthly. Uh, again, we cover everything from product spotlight to featured builders, and uh, obviously promoting the upcoming uh, hangouts, the builder hangouts uh, that you are part of tonight. So we hope that you do sign up. There's a link uh, to do so on the right hand uh, sidebar in the group chat, and I will also include it on the Google Plus page. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clevtool, C-L-E-V-T-O-O-L, and the same on Twitter, twitter.com slash clevtool. And the same at YouTube for the other videos. Exactly. So um, this I also, that, that was a great conclusion, Bill, but I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry. Okay. Um, I see at the end of Mark's last comment, he says, um, do you use an airflow adjuster on your rivet gun, or do you just adjust the PSI at the valve? We always use an airflow restrictor, not a regulator, but a restrictor on the base of the gun because that eliminates all the variables upstream from that. Your, your hose acts like a reservoir. When you pull the trigger, whatever volume of air you have in your hose is going right through the rivet gun, and then it will you know, regulate. Um, that's why we use a restrictor at the base of the gun. I know a lot of people will say to dial it at 45 for this, for 60 at this rivet, but we don't teach it that way. Uh, I know that people have good results that way, so you know, kind of try try what what you want to do and and see how it works for you. But we we run all air tools at 90 psi at the tool, and then we on the rivet gun only, we restrict it down to whatever it takes to slow it down for that particular rivet, and that's just kind of a trial and error thing, so you just uh, try one, and if it was too hard, you, or too, not hard enough, you, then you adjust it to, to do another one, so. All right, um, and we are doing this monthly, so if you have questions, um, you can go to the Google Plus page and you can post them, you can send them by email, and we'll add them to the agenda, whatever works for you, we'd be happy to um, be happy to to do what we can to share share what we know and like I said I, I really enjoy doing this kind of thing um, and getting people up to speed on on how to do things and and learning from from our customers too or, or a lot of a lot of people have great tips that's that's how I got to know most of my stuff and and uh, I really appreciate this and hope, hope to do this more often and hope to do a little bit better job of it so um, all right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody, and have a good night. Yep. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks, Bill. Bye-bye.